Okay, today we are going to start talking about evolution. Oh, goodness. Okay, so you should have three pages of notes. The first page is going to be the one that has the Unit 7, Part 2. So you have three pages of notes. One, the first one is the Unit 7, Part 2, Evolution. Sammy. Pass the papers back, put your phone down. That's the first page. The second page is the one that starts with over time offspring of individuals will be helpful with helpful blah, blah, blah. So over time offspring, that is your second page. Your third page is the origin of new species leads to blank. Okay, so three pages of notes. This, all three of these are going to be your evolution notes, notes which is number five in your notebook. So all three of these are number five in your notebook. So you got all three of them now, guys? We're good? What's wrong? Okay. Who else only has two sheets of paper? Everyone has three sheets of paper. Yes? Oh, sorry. Okay. Are we ready to start now? Okay. So we are going to start talking about evolution. So let us begin. Alright, so what is evolution? So evolution is just very basic definition. Evolution is just a change over time. So it's change in species over time. So this picture is a very crude picture of what evolution is. So we started off with one thing, and over a very long period of time, we got something different. Okay? But those two things still hold or still have the basic characteristics, the fundamental characteristics of those two things are still there. So this has wheels, it has four, it has a frame, you can sit in it. So now over time through evolution, now we have this. It still has wheels, but now it only has two. It still has a frame, but its frame is a little bit different. And now, and you can still sit on it. You just sit on it differently. So this is the idea of evolution, the theory of evolution, is that change over a very long period of time. Okay? So who do we have to thank for this theory of evolution? His name is Darwin, and he basically came up, him and some other people that we'll learn about, but he basically was the father of evolution. So he was the one who went out and did a bunch of research and put the theory of evolution together. So he said that evolution, which is a change over time, is the process by which modern organisms have descended from ancient organisms. Okay. Before, he, before his time, what people thought was the answer to, again, the big question is, how did we get here and how did we get what we have today? Where did it come from? How did it get here? So back then, before his time, the answer to that question was, well, the earth isn't that old. It's only about 10,000 years old. And what was there is what's here now. And what's here now will always be here. So nothing ever changes. It's the same as it has been from the beginning to the end. No changing. Nothing. So that was the answer. That was the reasoning that they had before his time. So then he went out and did a bunch of research that we're going to look at. And now we have our theory of evolution. Remember, it is a theory of evolution. I am just presenting you some of the information. You are your own person. You can make your own decisions. So another guy that we have to think, his name was John, James, John, James Hutton. And James Hutton was a geologist. So he did not care about the plants or the animals on Earth. 
He just cared about the earth itself, how old it was, and what kind of changes it had undergone. Because he said that the earth has changed. The earth has not been the same as it always has. It has changed. And it is a lot older than what we previously thought. So it's a lot older than 10,000 years. So this is all of his research. So he was a geologist. So he looked at rocks and he looked at uh, sediments. And I was going to say fossils, but he doesn't look at fossils. He looks at rocks and minerals and layers and what those layers tell you and the information and all that jazz. So that's what he did. Another geologist that was around the time, around the same time, was Charles Lyell. And he actually published a book called Principles of Geology. So he was another geologist that was concerned more of, okay, how old is the earth really? And what kind of changes has the earth undergone? So all of these geologists were seeing that, hey, the earth, the earth is really old and the earth has undergone a lot of changes. So Darwin, asked himself, okay, well, if the earth can change, and if the earth is really old and has done a lot of changes, why can't animals, why can't plants, why can't species change over a very long period of time, just like the earth might have done? Another guy that we need to talk about, his name was John Baptiste Lamarck. So John Baptiste Lamarck, he actually did work uh, with Darwin. So him and Darwin did work together, but they did not work side by side. So they didn't go and do research together. What happened was that they wrote letters back and forth to each other. They bounced ideas off of each other. They introduced different parts of their theories because each of them had their own theories. And they each talked to each other about their own theories. And so they kind of worked together to make this big theory of evolution. But they each kind of held on to a little bit of their own. So they worked together, but not completely together, if that makes any sense. So John Baptiste Lamarck's little uh, part of it is that he was focused on adaptation. So what are adaptations? How do they help or how do they hinder species and how do they move along the theory of evolution? So Lamarck had two main ideas when talking about adaptations. And the first one is the, the, the main idea or the um, concept of use versus disuse. So if you have an adaptation, if your species has an adaptation, um, and you are going to use that adaptation in order to benefit you, then through the use of that adaptation, that adaptation will become more prevalent in the population. Now that can go the other way. If you have something, so usually, hello? Okay. Mm -hmm. Bye Matthew. So if you have something, usually it's a body part. So if you have a body part that you are not really using, so you're not using it or disuse, then eventually over time, the adaptation becomes the loss of that body part. So if you've ever seen the skeleton of a whale, skeletons of whales, they have hip bones. They have hips. Why do whales have hips if they don't walk? Because hips are needed to walk, but whales don't walk, so why do they still have hip bones? So the theory of evolution and the theory behind the evolution of whales is that they were once land-walking mammals that moved into the ocean, and through the disuse argument, they lost the use of their, they didn't use their back legs, and so they retained those back legs and they don't have them anymore, but they still have the remnants, which is the hip bones. So use versus disuse. Um, inheritance of acquired characteristics is the other, um, no, this is the same one. It's talking about the same thing. So 
inheritance of acquired characteristics. So again, thinking of adaptations, adaptations come from your parents. They don't use the hip bones. So through, because it takes a very long time for you to lose something. So eventually they, eventually they could not have them anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It takes a very long time. So it just depends on along the timeline, when did they actually start losing those limbs is the question. Um, so the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So we obviously, we all know through our last unit that we get our genes, we get our traits from our parents, and we give our traits to our offspring. So generation after generation. So that is where the adaptations, that's how the adaptations survive through generation through generation is the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So the example they give you here is kangaroos. So we all know that kangaroos jump on their legs. So that means that the kangaroo's legs are going to be very, very strong. And so the individuals, the kangaroos that are going to survive, maybe those individuals have stronger legs than other individuals. And so the ones that are going to reproduce and produce offspring are the ones with the stronger legs and so on and so forth. Now, there is no evidence for this because the thing with evolution and the thing that we're going to learn about later on is that it does not fit into this nice little box. It doesn't have, you know, this book of rules and it follows all the rules and it happens all the time. It does not happen that way. That's why it's a theory. It does not check off all the boxes. It does not explain everything because we are talking about genes. So we have to think back to our previous unit and talking about genetics. There is a chance, there is a probability that some other adaptation or some other characteristic could come into the population. And so you always have the possibility of just because the fittest will survive doesn't mean that the not fittest will not survive. So you have to keep that in the back of your head. All right, um, another cool thing that we, I want to talk about is giraffes. So a lot of people like to use giraffes to kind of prove the theory of evolution. So the question is, so this is due to fossil record, this is what we have as the ancestor to giraffes. So this is what they look like. And then over a very, very, very long period of time, so millions of years, we now have our giraffes that look like this. So why do giraffes have long necks? That's the question. Who thinks they know the answer? Yes. So they usually eat high off trees, okay? Anyone else have any ideas? Okay, that's a good one. So all the short vegetation was getting eaten, so they had to resort to eating taller trees. Yeah, so it could be an adaptation. So, so you, the taller you are, the more you're able you're, to, you're able to see. So you're able to see predators trying to come at you. That's a good one. All right, so those are all good theories as to why giraffes have long necks. But now let's look at another theory that you may not have thought about. So everyone needs to be facing this way. You need to put your phones away. I need to watch this video. How did the giraffe get its long neck? Characterized by its long legs, long neck, and distinctive spotted pattern, many people first believed the giraffe was a cross between a leopard and a camel, which is reflected in its scientific name, Giraffa camelopardinus. Giraffes live primarily in savanna areas in the sub-Saharan region of Africa. Their extreme height allows them to eat leaves and shoots located much higher than other animals can reach. In particular, they seek out acacia trees. Their long tongues are helpful in eating because they help pull leaves from the trees. Spending most of the day eating, a full-grown giraffe consumes over 45 kilograms of leaves and twigs a day. Around 15 million years ago, 
antelope-like animals were roaming the dry grasslands of Africa. There was nothing very special about them, but some of their necks were a bit long. Within a mere six million years, they had evolved into animals that looked like modern giraffes, though the modern species only turned up around one million years ago. The tallest living land animal, a giraffe stands between 4.5 and 5 meters tall, and almost half that height is neck. Most people assume that giraffes' long necks evolved to help them feed. If you have a long neck, runs the argument, you can eat leaves on tall trees that your rivals can't reach. But there is another possibility. The prodigious necks may have little to do with food and everything to do with sex. The evidence supporting the high feeding theory is surprisingly weak. Giraffes in South Africa do spend a lot of time browsing for food high up in trees, but elsewhere in Africa they don't seem to bother, even when food is scarce. Giraffes' necks are long, but there have been longer ones. Sauropod dinosaurs trunk them easily. The dinosaur Mementosaurus, for instance, had a neck over nine meters long, four times the longest of giraffe necks. Long necks come at a cost. Because a giraffe's brain is around two meters above its heart, the heart has to be big and powerful. In fact, for the blood to reach the brain, it has to be pumped at the highest pressure of any animal. So there must be a big payback to keep giraffes' necks so long. The latest theory, and it's a surprise this hasn't come up before, given biologists' fixation with it, is that the long necks are the results of sexual selection. That is, they evolved in males as a way of competing for females. Male giraffes fight for females by necking. They stand side by side and swing the backs of their heads into each other's ribs and legs. To help with this, their skulls are unusually thick and they have horn-like growths called ossicones on the tops of their heads. Their heads, in short, are battering rams and are quite capable of breaking their opponent's bones. Having a long and powerful neck would be an advantage in these jewels, and it's been found that males with long necks tend to win, and also that females prefer them. The necks for sex idea also helps explain why giraffes have extended their necks so much more than their legs. If giraffes evolved to reach higher branches, we might expect their legs to have lengthened as fast as their necks, but they haven't. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching and... All right, so... Real quick, because I, I think this is... Okay, so if you have never seen two giraffes fighting, this is how they do it. So they stand side by side, they get ready, and they literally throw their heads into the other giraffe. Wow. And their heads have become so thick and hard that by them throwing their head, they can actually break the bones of the other giraffe. Because of their neck. So, yes. Okay, so. So, the argument that giraffes have long necks, there are good there are good answers. So the answer of, hold on, let me let me do my little spiel. So the answer of, okay, it needs to reach high up, it's a good one, but it's not, it wasn't seen in the wild. So what they did was they asked, okay, is this really the case or is there something else happening? So they went out and they did research and they looked at wild giraffes and what they were noticing was that these giraffes, instead of, if food was scarce, Instead of finding the really tall trees, they would just keep walking until they found a tree that was at their height. So they actually seeked out trees that were not taller than them instead of just, instead of just reaching tall. 
So they traveled long distances in order to find the food that they wanted. So, and again, the other part of that, okay, if you're reaching high, why are your legs also not getting taller? So if you look back here, these legs have pretty much stayed the same over time, but the necks are getting longer. So the way that they fight, the way that they, um, the way that females select them for mating is that they're going to sit there and stand next to each other and throw their heads and that's how they fight. So you need a very large, heavy, thick skull. Well, if you're gonna throw that skull everywhere, then you need a long, sturdy, muscular neck in order to get a lot of movement behind it and allow you to win the fight. Yes, MG. Oh, yeah. Hmm? One has to one has to say, okay, I've had enough, I lose. So no uh, I, very rarely, but it, I think it does happen. But very rarely. Eventually, the one who's losing will realize I'm losing. I don't really want to die, so I'm gonna back off and I'll try again later. Yes, I think so. Yes. Like in our in our spine, so not neck, just the neck, but the whole spine. Yes. All right. So going back to Darwin, and Darwin did this really cool thing where he went and traveled the world. So he got on a ship called the was it the HMS? I don't know what HMS stands for, but it was called the Beagle. Okay. So he got on his ship and he ping ponged his way throughout the oceans, and he came across this group of islands, if you've heard of them, called the Galapagos Islands. And here, he found a lot of information, a lot of evidence for the theory of evolution, and a lot of things that he was not expecting. So this is why we focus so much on the Galapagos Islands, was because a lot of what he found was not what he, what he was expecting at all, okay? So what did he find at those islands? He found birds, he found a lot of other animals and plants, and the whole common, you know, the common thread of all these plants and animals were that they all looked different. That should not have happened, because if you, I will show you what the Galapagos Islands look like, um, but it's a group of islands, so they're pretty close together, and those islands are not too far away from the mainland of South America, of Ecuador. So it's the group of islands a little bit off of the coast of Ecuador. So you have a group of islands that are pretty close together, and those group of islands are pretty close to the mainland. What he was seeing, so back up, so what should happen is you have all these islands together, and you have all these islands close to the mainland. What should happen is that all of the plants and animals that live on those islands and that live on that mainland, they should all look almost the same. They all live in the same vicinity of each other, so they should all look the same. Well, he did not see that. In fact, what he did see was he saw all these animals and all these plants that looked different. So real quick, just so you know, So here. so here are the Galapagos Islands. So you have this big one here, and you have all these little islands, right? And then, okay, and then it is off the coast of Ecuador. So what he thought was that species that lived here, since they're not that far away from here, these should look similar and especially all of the animals that are on these islands should all pretty much look the same. But that's not what he saw. So the question then arose, why? So he observed the different animals. He studied them. He drew pictures of them. He spent quite a bit of time in these islands looking at all these different animals. And so he had the question of, why are these organisms, why are these animals, why are these plants, he even studied plants, why are they very different than each other 
And why are they even more different from those who live on the mainland in South America and Ecuador? Why is there such variation? What is going on? So one example that he saw was with different tortoises. These are tortoises. These are not turtles. There is a difference between a tortoise and a turtle. If you put a tortoise in a river or a lake, it will drown. Please do not put a tortoise in the water. It will not survive. The differences between, real quick, the differences between tortoise and turtle is that tortoises have chunky, stubby legs that are flat on the bottom because they walk on the ground. Turtles have hands that are more like ours, so they spread out more, so they're thin, and even some of them have webbing so that they can swim through the water. Also, tortoises usually have a thicker shell, so they're a little bit lighter, and turtles are a little bit thinner, okay? So turtles go in the water, tortoises stay on land. Okay, I wanted to make sure that I taught someone that at some point in their life. All right, so what he was seeing with the tortoises of Galapagos was that these three in particular all had different kinds of shells. They kind of look the same, but they are different. So this one down here, this shell, and he has a little short neck, this shell acts more of like a hood, so it might be that this turtle here lives in a very, uh, very sunny. There might not be a lot of vegetation to protect him from the sun. And so he uses his shell to kind of protect him from the sun. Whereas this tortoise, tortoise, not turtle, tortoise, over here, there may be a lot of vegetation. So he has coverage from the sun. So he doesn't need to use his shell so his shell is further back and his neck is longer so that he can reach that vegetation. And then on this island up here, maybe it's a in-between. So maybe there's chunks of vegetation and chunks where there's not vegetation. So he has the option of going and getting coverage from plants or going and staying out in the sun if he wants to. So he's gonna have a shell that's kind of in the middle. So it kind of has a little bit of a hood and he kind of has like an intermediate sized neck. So it's not very long, but it's not very short. But it's all based on what environment you live in. So just because you're close together doesn't mean that you're not gonna have different adaptations and different characteristics. Another animal that you may very well know that he studied are his finches. Well, not his finches, but he studied the finches that were on the island. What he was mainly looking at was their beak size and shape because depending on what they ate depends on how big their beak was or how small their beak was. Was it thick or was it thin? Was it long or was it short? So he looked at all these finches. He looked at what they ate and then he noted how their beaks looked. So if a bird eats more seeds, those seeds are going to be hard to get into. So you need a thick, hardy beak that's a little bit shorter in order to get into those seeds. So this bird probably lives on one of the islands that there's just seeds everywhere. There's nothing else to eat, just seeds. So this bird, this finch, has adapted and passed on that adaptation in order to survive that location. Whereas this bird eats fruits or buds, so other kinds of fruits. So you still need a thicker beak, but at the end you have a little pointy part so that you can pierce the fruit and open it up. So this bird probably lives in, a, uh, in trees that have fruit. Uh, this one and these three all probably eat insects because their beaks are long and skinny, but each of their beaks is still different from each other. So this one is going to go on the ground and search underneath logs and eat grubs. This one has actually learned how to use a tool, so it will find a stick 
and it will put that stick inside a tree and stab until it gets an insect. And then this one is going to, similar to this one, go on the ground and search for insects. But instead of like looking underneath logs, it's just gonna find the insects that are on top. So those insects are gonna be quick. So it has to have a short little, little beak that is gonna be precise in grabbing those insects. So again, depending on what you eat will depend on your adaptation for your beak. But they all literally live in the same vicinity. So the theory of evolution explains why all these different birds in the same area have different beaks. Because if they live in the same area, then they should look the same, but they don't because they have evolved different adaptations depending on what food source they use. All right. So, uh, species living today descended from ancestral species. So a key point of evolution is that over a long period of time, from ancestor to what we have now, so generation after generation after generation, a long period of time, so millions of years, we have descent with modification. So over that time, these species have been modified and they have adapted in order to survive in their environment. The thing that you have to keep in mind is that again, with genetics, there is always a chance that something else can be produced. So something that the parents did not show, now their offspring are showing for. And if that is a benefit, then that could be an adaptation that will evolve over time. If that is not a benefit, then it could die out. But if that offspring is still able to survive, then something that may not look like an adaptation might still evolve in the population. So again, the theory of evolution does not check all the boxes. It does not fit in with all of our rules that we need in order to have a law of evolution. So it is just a theory, okay? So looking at these two hairs, so a hair is pretty much the same as a rabbit. I think hares are just wild, rabbits are domesticated, okay? So looking at these two, you have essentially two different types depending on where they live. So this one is going to live in a warmer climate where there's a bunch of trees and so it's going to need to camouflage in with those trees. This one is going to live in a more cold, uh, a cold climate where nine months out of the year, it's going to blend in with all the snow that's there. But let's say that for some reason one year, the snow lasts longer than expected and so different things are going to happen that are going to affect the evolution of that species. Let's say that the snow doesn't last as long and summer comes more quickly and so more of those species are going to be eaten because now they can't camouflage. So a bunch of different factors are going to affect the evolution of these species as a whole. So it doesn't fit in that perfect little box that we want it to. So the other main part of um, evolution is this uh, concept of natural selection. So natural selection is the process by which individuals with inherited characteristics well suited for their environment leave more offspring. So animals' jobs, their one and only job is to survive and reproduce. They are going to do whatever they need to do in order to do that. So they are going to do, do whatever they need to do in order to survive in their environment. And they're gonna pass on those traits to their offspring. So if you are an offspring that got an adaptation from their parents and you survive and reproduce, then you're going to further that adaptation. But if you are an offspring that maybe didn't get that adaptation or didn't get the best version of that adaptation, you might not survive to make offspring or you might survive and you might make offspring and you might make a new adaptation for a different region of that environment. So lots of different things are affecting evolution. This is where our natural selection comes into play. There are different modes of natural selection that you will learn about. And so there's many different things affecting the theory of evolution as a whole. 
All right. Last couple of things before we leave. Um, I am going to go ahead and hand out your next worksheet. So this is number six in your notebook. I'm gonna go ahead and get that out to you just so that I don't forget. Don't put away your notes, we're not done yet. of natural selection. So the four types or the four factors of natural selection that you need to know of is that the first one says that organisms produce more offspring than can survive. So these are things that are going to affect evolution. Okay. So if you, so your job is to survive and reproduce. Now, if you do that too well, or if you do that too much, your environment, whatever place that you live, can only produce so much food. If you are producing more offspring than food available in the environment, then some of your offspring are not going to survive. And that is not what you want. So you have to be careful of, are you making too many individuals? Or are you not making enough individuals? Number two, variations are found among individuals of a species. So again, sometimes an adaptation can be a different color. And so um, different colors could either be beneficial or it could be neutral, it could be no benefit, or it could be a disaster and it could result in that offspring not surviving. But there are variations and the variations could then evolve further and branch off into other species over a long period of time. Those variations are passed on to offspring. So we know that we get our traits from our parents and we give our traits to our offspring. But as we saw last unit, sometimes there is an outlier that we're not expecting to see. So this mama cat has three white kittens and one gray one. So there are sometimes genes in your gene pool. So a pool is a collection of genes of the population Sometimes there are genes in the gene pool that you are not aware of and that could come about in one of your offspring. And if that offspring survives, then that gene is then passed down further and further. And that could be another evolution. So again, really light mom, but really dark babies. So that could be a variation that could cause another evolution. Number four, some variations allow members of a population to survive or reproduce better than others. So another thing that you have to keep in mind is that just because there is an adaptation, does that mean that doesn't mean that that adaptation is only going to allow those with the adaptation to survive. So if you have two different moths, one suited for a mossy environment and one suited for a dark environment, if you have them both in the same environment, not all the time is, so if we have this mossy environment, this one is not well adapted to live in this environment. It is darkly colored, it's gonna be eaten. But that doesn't mean that every single time this moth is going to be eaten. This moth could survive, it could get lucky and it could survive and it could you know, produce offspring that have that trait. So again, evolution does not doesn't work all the time. It doesn't check off all our boxes. It doesn't fit everything. So over time, offspring of individuals with helpful variations make up more and more of a population. So this is why we have such a variety of species is because all these variations, if they survived and produced offspring that had those variations, then all of these produce opportunities for evolution to take hold and for us to get more and more species. All right, so real quick before you leave, that worksheet that I gave you, that is number six in your notebook. That is talking about the different types of natural selection. So the first one is talking about genetic drift. 
The second one is talking about bottleneck effect, and the third one is talking about founder effect. You need to do this on your own because you need to learn about that. I do not have time to do it in class. I'm trying to get through this unit through the end of the unit. Sammy, did you pass back all these? Yes. Alex, did you pass back all of them? Hold you. Oh, I need to Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, I thought I counted correctly. I'm sorry. Third one. So, okay, your quiz, guys, listen. Your quiz on Friday is only on classification. So, nothing from today. So, nothing about evolution. So, the review worksheet that we did yesterday and your classification packet from number one, that is what you need to study for your quiz on Friday. You will have an evolution quiz, but next week. Okay, so do that worksheet. I will post a key later on, but you need to do it on your own and then check your answers when I do post the key. Okay.